What is up, everyone? Welcome to part one of a two-part series finale for this little project of mine. I figured it would make sense to end on one of the more inspiring subjects I came across during this quiet time for touring. It was inspired by Robert Scovel's In The Lab YouTube series, which I highly recommend you checking out if you haven't already. I'm talking about manual delay compensation. Now we all have to have some kind of delay compensation when it comes to parallel paths, but I'm relatively new to the idea of aligning every single input to exit the console at the same exact time. Why are you ending your series with delay compensation? Because I thought it would be an incredibly interesting subject to cover on this platform I've created. I think for audio engineers, our truths come to us in what we hear. And when I tried this in quarantine more than a couple months back, I was really floored by the difference in my mix, which is why I felt compelled to share this with you. That way you could make your own mind up. Do you really think it's that important? Well, you tell me. <laughs> you could hear the differences in the mix. I feel like there's a little bit less focus in the low end. I feel like the snare might feel a little bit more loose. The kick becomes a little bit brighter. And I feel like the reverb tail changes a little bit. Not to mention the stereo spread. I find it super fascinating that something little like aligning your inputs can make this big of a difference. I think Scoville was onto something when he theorized that one of the contributing factors to analog sounding so good was that there was no latency, meaning every input that entered the console left at the exact same time. Many different delays across many inputs can cause timing discrepancies in the summation of your mix. I mean, think about it. If we are all searching for a drum sound, that might mean we process our drums a little bit more than the rest of the inputs. If we're adding more processing, that might mean we're adding time to those inputs, which might mean our drum inputs could be anywhere from 3 milliseconds to 7 milliseconds later than the rest of the inputs in our mix. Now that might not seem like a lot, but I feel like it does affect the way the master bus reacts over your entire mix. The drum's transients are cutting a little bit later in the mix, and this alone could also draw out the release of your master bus compressor. I also found a big difference in my effects. The manual delay compensation that I'm adding is being added at the input stage. Since my effect sends are post fader, which is also post delay, this kind of manual delay compensation will also align your effects within your mix. Now in full disclosure, this mix was created before I induced manual delay compensation and finished after I manually delayed all my inputs. One would argue, depending on where your mindset is on input alignment, this would affect the way you approach your mix, regardless if you're utilizing manual delay compensation or not. Why do we even have to manually delay anything? Great question. Anytime you use any external processing or even digital processors like Waves or UA, you are inducing some latency on the path of that input channel. Regarding analog inserts in the digital realm, Anytime you leave the digital realm, it takes a certain amount of processing to convert that audio from digital to analog and back to digital. This D to A, digital to analog conversion, then A to D, analog to digital conversion, always creates latency on all digital desks. But not all desks handle this the same way. Some desks have latency correction and others don't, which means inserting a piece of analog gear will slow down this input when compared to other inputs in your mix. And yes, this delay would be very negligible by itself, but could be problematic if the input shared a sound source. Regarding external digital processing, inserting something like waves can cause latency in two different ways. The first way would be via the server network buffer which is the speed in which the audio travels from the console to the external server and then back to the console. The second way would be the choice of plugin. Not all plugins are created equal and some plugins induce more latency than others. In SuperRack, Waves did make it super easy 
for you to figure out where the latency is being added on top of the server network buffer. For instance, you could see at the input rack the total amount of latency on the entire rack. And if you look at the bottom left corner of each rack, you can see how much latency is being induced by each plugin. Now, even within the console's platform, without external processing, it is still possible to cause latency. Things like parallel compression, group-to-group -group busing, and even inserting special effects within the console's dedicated effects rack can sometimes add latency. So it's very important for you to understand how your console deals with automatic delay compensation within its own design and within your workflow. This sounds complicated. Where do we even start? Well, a good way to start is to refer to your console's manual regarding internal processing latency and double check those measurements throughout your show file. Not every manufacturer may have the sample delay reporting on all internal processing, but Allen and Heath actually does, which was super helpful. But I still went through to double check some things that I was doing within my file, just to make sure everything was aligned properly. I started by making a spreadsheet or a grid where I went through and measured the latency of various things I do in my show file. That way I could start to predict what kind of latency I was inducing within the console platform. Then I made a second spreadsheet and used formulas to make a grid that would automatically calculate all channel latency needed to fully align the show. I did this by making a line-by-line -line grid for each input. Then I would add samples of latency induced at each stage of the channel. As you can see, I have two insert point columns. I added a group and two aux columns. And I also added a dedicated column for the Wave Server Network Buffer, or WNL for short. As you can see, any inputs making two trips into waves, I simply doubled the number to compensate for the routing. Once I went line by line and channel by channel, I could identify my longest path. Now this path will guide us into how much delay we will need to align everything else to it. I also added a few samples onto my longest path, and I put that number into my longest path field up here. Again, using formulas in the spreadsheet, I took my longest path values and subtracted the total input latency and formed another column labeled compensation needed. That way it will automatically calculate how much delay each input would need to match the longest path. This still seems very complicated. Oh, it is. This isn't something you want to take on lightly. I mean, walking through all this, as you can gather, you have to know how you're going to mix the show, which isn't always the case. And you need to do more than just a spreadsheet and putting in some numbers. I tried numerous times to run just the spreadsheet, and I almost always made errors in the calculations. This is why I highly recommend you checking your work through an FFT or Smart. How does that help you double check your work? Well, you'll just have to tune in to part two when we jump into SMART and the process of calculating our latency and how I go about aligning my channels. Well, that's it for this episode of A Sum of Two Buses. I hope you dug it. If you did, please like, please share, and please subscribe. Please. Until next time, take care and be safe.